Welcome to British Murders, a true crime podcast with a focus on British murder cases. My name's Stuart Blues, and I'm excited for you to join me on this journey of morbid discovery. I'm by no means an expert on the subjects of homicide and serial killers. However, I have always had a sick fascination with them. Together, we will learn about some of the lesser known British murderers, as well as glimpsing occasionally at some of the more notorious ones. The bite-sized presentation of this podcast is intentional, as we look to cover an overview of the respective timelines of each case succinctly. Welcome to the Season 1 special of British Murders. This is the first of two episodes focusing on the crimes of Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, two of Britain's most notorious serial killers. This week, we'll be focusing on the early life and background of the deadly couple, who will be forever known as the Moors Murderers. We'll also explore the build-up and execution of their very first murder. Next week, we'll focus on how the couple carried out the rest of their killing spree before being captured in late 1965. The Peak District is a region of hills and highlands in northern England. It was designated as the UK's first ever national park on April 17, 1951. Within the Peak District are a number of moorland areas, more commonly referred to as moors. Before I carry on, I realise that to most of my UK listeners, the way I pronounce moor may be considered as wrong with the correct pronunciation being moor. Well, I say moor, as a cow says moo, and if you add the r, it becomes moor. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. One of the moors within the Peak District fittingly lies within the Dark Peak area. This is the higher and wilder part of the Peak District. I'm referring to Saddleworth Moor in Greater Manchester, Northwest England. This particular moor reaches over 400 metres or 1,312 feet above sea level and is frighteningly close to where I live, around 12 miles away. It would probably only take me 30 minutes or so to get there. This scenic landscape is the primary location for this special episode of British Murders. Now that all 10 episodes of Season 1 have been published and are available to stream, I thought it would be interesting to publish a longer, two-part episode focusing on some of Britain's more notorious serial killers. This will be a regular thing that I will do at the end of each season, with you, the audience, deciding who the special episode is based on. A while back I put out a poll on social media to ask you all who I should cover for the Season 1 special. I can reveal that the winners were Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, better known as the Moors Murderers. We'll start our story by looking at the background and early life of Ian Brady, the elder of the two. On January 2nd, 1938, Single mother Margaret Stewart, known affectionately as Peggy, gave birth to a baby boy in Glasgow, Scotland. She named him Ian Duncan Stewart. Peggy worked as a waitress in a tea room, a place British people visit specifically for the purpose of drinking tea. As his mother was unmarried, Ian was born illegitimately. According to Peggy, Ian's father worked as a reporter for a local Glasgow newspaper, but died in the months leading up to Ian's birth. Having said that, the true identity of Ian's father has never been confirmed. Peggy was unable to afford a babysitter whilst she worked as a waitress. This resulted in Ian being left on his own for hours at a time. Her financial difficulty was exacerbated by her lack of support from either family or a spouse. This resulted in Peggy giving Ian up for adoption when he was only four months old. He was taken into the care of local couple John and Mary Sloan, who were experienced parents, having had four children of their own. As he was growing up, 
Ian received regular visits from his birth mother until he was around 12 years old. However, she never told him who she really was. It was for this reason that Ian's name was changed to Ian Sloan, taking on the surname of his adoptive parents. At the tender age of nine, Ian and his adoptive family visited Loch Lomond, a freshwater lake in Scotland. Loch is the Scottish word for lake, by the way. It was there that he started to develop a love for the great outdoors. The family then relocated to a large housing estate called Pollock, located on the southwestern side of Glasgow. Ian managed to get into Shawlands Academy, one of Scotland's most multicultural state schools. I'd like to quickly clarify what I mean when I say Shawlands Academy was a state school. In the UK, we call government-funded schools state schools, and we call privately funded schools public schools. This differs to the American system, which call government-funded schools public schools and privately funded schools private schools. Confusing, I know. During his time at Shawlands Academy, Ian's behaviour started to deteriorate. He was a difficult child who struggled to fit in with other children. He had regular temper tantrums, likely as a result of his loneliness, something which his adoptive parents described him as. He was summoned twice to juvenile court as a teenager for breaking and entering. Leaving Shawlands Academy at the age of 15, Ian took on a variety of jobs over the next couple of years, including that of a tea boy at a shipyard and a butcher's messenger boy. A rather jealous boy, Ian once threatened an old girlfriend with a flick knife when he found out that she had attended a dance event with another boy. By the time Ian turned 17, he had multiple charges against him in juvenile court. He was placed on probation with the stipulation that he had to live with his birth mother. Peggy was living in Manchester with her new husband, Patrick Brady, at this point. Patrick was a fruit merchant from Ireland who secured Ian a job as a fruit porter at Smithfield Market in Manchester. This area is known today as Manchester's Northern Quarter. Ian then changed his name to that which he would be known as forevermore. Ian Brady. For reference, I will now refer to Ian as simply Brady for the remainder of the story. Brady continued his criminal behaviour despite securing a job and being back with his mum and stepdad. Within a year of moving to Manchester, Brady was caught with a sack full of lead seals he had stolen and was trying to smuggle out of the market. He was sent to Manchester Prison more commonly known as Strange Ways, after the area in which the prison lies, for a period of three months. Given that Brady was still a minor, he hadn't yet turned 18, he was subsequently sentenced to serve two years in a borstal for training. I've discussed borstals on previous episodes, but for anyone who is unaware, a borstal is essentially a prison for young offenders. He served his time in a variety of borstals in London, West Yorkshire and East Yorkshire. On November 14th, 1957, Brady was released and returned to his mother's home in Manchester. More jobs came and went before Brady secured an office job working for Millwoods, a manufacturing company, in January of 1959. Brady loved to read and, as he put it, better himself. This included studying German and reading Mein Kampf, the autobiographical manifesto of Nazi leader Adolf Hitler. Let us now take a look at the upbringing of the other half of this deadly duo, Myra Hindley, who I shall refer to simply as Hindley. Hindley was born on July 23rd, 1942, making her four years Brady's junior. She was born in Crumpsall, a suburb of Manchester in northwest England, but was raised in Gorton, another area of Manchester. Like Brady, Hindley didn't have the best start in life. 
She grew up in a rundown house in which she had to sleep in the same room as her parents, Bob Hindley and his wife Nellie. Bob was an ex-British army man who fought during World War II and his reputation as a tough guy preceded him. Unfortunately for Hindley, she was expected to carry on this tough guy persona. Bob taught her to fight and insisted that she stick up for herself. When Bob felt like she wasn't, he would beat her. These beatings happened often. In August of 1946, when Hindley was four, Bob and Nellie welcomed another daughter to the world, whom they named Maureen. Within a year of Maureen's birth, Bob and Nellie decided to send five-year-old Hindley to live with her grandmother. Hindley got into a bit of a scuffle when she was eight. A boy from the neighbourhood had made her cheeks bleed after scratching her during a fight. Rather than fighting back and sticking up for herself as Dad would have wanted, she instead ran home in tears. Bob, furious at Hindley's flight response, warned her that if she did not go back and strike the boy, he would instead beat her. As a result, Hindley searched for the boy and proceeded to punch him multiple times until he was a defenceless wreck on the ground. I'm just going to interject here briefly by highlighting the theory of nature versus nurture. This is a common debate when it comes to serial killers as there are those who believe individuals can be born evil. These individuals have perfectly normal childhoods with minimal negative external factors affecting their development, yet they still become serial killers. This is called the nature argument. Then there are those who believe children are products of their environments, meaning a tough childhood can have irreversibly detrimental effects on a child's brain that can lead to inexplicable behaviour later on in life. This is the nurture argument. The theory that serial killers are in a sense moulded to be that way. Let me know what your thoughts are on this controversial debate via my social media channels. And now back to the story. Growing up, Hindley was close with a boy called Michael Higgins. When she was 15, Higgins invited her to go swimming in an old, disused reservoir with some of their friends. Hindley rejected the offer, opting instead to spend time with another friend. By a cruel twist of fate, while swimming in the reservoir, Higgins drowned. Blaming herself for not being there, Hindley, a good swimmer, felt she would have been able to rescue Higgins and prevent him from drowning. Hindley was baptised as a Catholic and became increasingly drawn to the Roman Catholic Church after she started attending Ryder Brow Secondary Modern, a school in Manchester. A bright student, Hindley always got good grades and was considered to have an above-average IQ. Her attendance, on the other hand, left a lot to be desired. She would typically skip school to spend time with her grandmother at home. Soon after, Hindley joined the Catholic Church, taking on the confirmation name of Veronica, and received her first communion in November 1958. A confirmation name is one chosen by a Catholic which is added to their existing names, the theory being that as a child, they weren't responsible enough to choose their own name and were therefore given one by their parents. Communion is a Christian ceremony based on Jesus' last meal with his disciples, whereby believers consume bread and wine representing the body, blood, soul and divinity of Christ. Please let me know if any of that isn't quite right. Hindley had a variety of jobs before she turned 18. She was a junior office worker for a while at a couple of engineering companies, however she either never stuck with it long enough or was fired for not turning up to work. She developed an interest in martial arts at this point, specifically judo. She went to lessons each week, but struggled to find sparring partners. She had a habit of holding on to her offensive grips for longer than was deemed acceptable to most. A judo grip is where you grab your opponent's judo suit, known as a gi, in such a way as to gain an advantageous position, 
whether that be to set up a judo throw or to execute a takedown. In January of 1961, Hindley secured a role as a typist at Millwoods, the same manufacturing company where Brady had secured an office job two years earlier. It was landing this role with Millwoods that led to the two murderers meeting. For Hindley, it was love at first sight. She was obsessed with Brady. She was charmed by his blue eyes, dark hair and perfect skin. She noted that Brady maintained his appearance to such a level that he appeared to manicure his fingernails. Even after finding out that he had a criminal record, she was still fascinated with this enigmatic loner. Hindley kept a daily journal and it soon began to fill up with entries dedicated to her constant thoughts of Brady. Even dating other men couldn't take her mind off of him, and this was before the pair had even been formally introduced. The first time Brady and Hindley spoke was on July 27th, 1961, six months into Hindley's tenure with Millwoods. At first, their relationship was nothing more than that of a colleague. Well, to Brady at least. All the while, Hindley's fascination grew, resulting in many more journal entries until Brady finally asked her out on December 22nd, 1961. They did what typical young adults do. They went to the cinema and watched a movie. This became a regular thing for the couple. They would watch an X-rated movie before returning to Hindley's house to drink wine. Being a Nazi sympathiser, Brady would often recommend Nazi propaganda books to Hindley, with the pair often reading such material to each other on their lunch breaks. They would also borrow books from the local library which focused on torture, crime and philosophy. Some of their preferred authors were Marquis de Sade, a French philosopher and child molester who wrote the novel 120 Days of Sodom, Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher, and Fyodor Dostoevsky, a Russian philosopher who wrote the novel Crime and Punishment. Brady's interest in National Socialism soon rubbed off on Hindley, who found herself moving towards idealising the concept of an Aryan race. Using bleach, she dyed her hair blonde and wore heavy, red-coloured lipstick at all times. She wore leather jackets, short skirts and knee-high boots to further enhance her new and provocative image. All of these ideas were planted within Hindley by Brady and his ideologies. Despite her obsession with Brady, Hindley at one point wrote a letter to an old friend explaining that she was once drugged by him. She said that if she were ever found dead, her friend should go to the police and tell them that Brady was somehow involved. Hindley was terrified of Brady, yet remained fixated on him. The letter was later destroyed at Hindley's request, but she has gone on record since as saying, quote, Within months, he had convinced me that there was no God at all. He could have told me that the earth was flat, the moon was made of green cheese, and the sun rose in the west. I would have believed him. Such was his power of persuasion." Unquote. Hindley had connections in the gun world and soon acquired a 22 caliber rifle from a gun shop in Manchester after being vouched for by her friend George Clitheroe. George was president of the Cheadle Rifle Club based in Stockport, Greater Manchester. George refused Hindley's entry to the club, however, as well as to that of another pistol club. This was mainly down to Hindley's short fuse and violent temper. She was also a rather poor shot. Regardless, Hindley managed to purchase two more guns from members of the pistol club, a 45 caliber Webley revolver and a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver. The pair then decided to take up photography as a hobby. They would often take explicit pictures of each other and develop the photographs at home in their own makeshift darkroom. This essentially completed the shift from a shy, frightened young girl to a raunchy, more confident woman. In June of 1963, Brady moved into Hindley's grandmother's house. 
It wasn't long before the couple's sadist exploits and fantasies took an even more sinister turn. By July of 1963, Brady's twisted fantasies culminated when he started telling Hindley that they should look to commit, quote, the perfect murder. The pair would often get drunk on an evening and walk through the countryside whilst discussing the intricate details of their plan. The plan was as follows. Hindley would hire a van and drive around, with Brady following behind on a motorbike. Once Brady had chosen his victim, he would flash his headlights and Hindley would pick them up. They would then drive to the secluded moors, kill their victim and bury the body. On July 12, 1963, their plan was put into motion. Hindley started to drive around in a hired van with Brady following behind on a motorbike. Spotting a young girl walking alone, Brady flashed his headlights. Hindley, however, recognising the intended victim as one of her mother's eight-year-old neighbours, ignored the signal and carried on driving. Later that evening, Brady signalled again when he saw another girl walking alone. This time, Hindley slowed down and offered the girl a ride. The girl was 16-year-old Pauline Reed, who was on her way to a local disco at the Railway Workers Social Club. She had originally intended to go with her three friends, Linda, Barbara and Pat, however they were forced to pull out at the last minute when their parents discovered that alcohol would be available. Undeterred, Pauline decided to go by herself. After leaving the house, Pauline was unknowingly followed by two of her friends. They didn't believe that she would actually attend the disco by herself, so they followed her. In an attempt to surprise Pauline, the two girls took a shortcut so that they would arrive at the party first. They eagerly waited for Pauline to arrive, but she never did. Pauline went to school with Hindley's younger sister, Maureen, and as a result did not hesitate to get into the vehicle. Pauline knew Hindley and trusted her. This wasn't a stranger after all, it was her friend's older sister. Hindley drove towards Saddleworth Moor, explaining to Pauline that she had lost a rather expensive glove there and wanted to try and find it. Pauline, powerless to refuse, agreed to help Hindley search for this lost glove. Soon after they arrived, Brady turned up on his motorbike. Hindley calmly explained that Brady was a friend and would be helping them look for the glove. Now this is where the story has two differing accounts, that of Hindley and that of Brady. According to Hindley, Pauline was taken by Brady onto the moor whilst she waited in the van. 30 minutes later, Brady returned. He was alone. He encouraged Hindley to get out of the van and they walked back to where the now deceased body of Pauline Reed lay. Pauline's throat had been cut twice. One of the cuts was so deep that her coat and throat chain had been forced into it. Hindley then asked Brady if he had raped Pauline, to which he replied, Of course I did. Brady returned to the van to retrieve a spade, whilst Hindley waited with Pauline's body. When he returned, they dug a grave and buried Pauline's body before returning home. In Brady's account, he stated that Hindley was not only there for the duration of the attack, but she took part in the sexual assault of Pauline as well. Pauline's parents, Amos and Joan, grew concerned when the clock struck midnight and their daughter had still not returned home. They went out to look for her, but found nothing. Hindley and Brady spotted Joan frantically searching for her daughter as they pulled into their neighbourhood. The following day, Pauline's parents informed the police that she was missing. Police then conducted their own search, but again it came to nothing. Pauline appeared to have vanished off the face of the earth. That concludes the first part of this two-part episode focusing on the story of British murderers Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Join me next week for the second and final part of this season one special. For more on British murders, please like and subscribe to my channel on social media. 
All the links are in the episode description. Please send your British murder case suggestions to me via social media or via email, which is britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com for me to cover in future episodes. If you are enjoying British murders, please leave me a review on iTunes as it really helps my channel to grow and would be greatly appreciated. For now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next week, cheerio.